gonna mug me. I'm not gonna mug you. Is that gorgeous or what, eh? And I believe I can run the Peace and Marathon. Download Veely now. Water, lakes like this, have always attracted people's attention. Our reservoirs provide us with a place to play and a pretty view. But places like this used to be free-flowing rivers. They were altered by the hands of humans to provide for our needs and our desires. There is one, however, that provides us with an unparalleled glimpse into one of the wildest and most diverse stretches of the Appalachians. A place that, despite our hands, shows us that nature finds a way. One of National Geographic's 50 last best places on the planet. Join me on today's expedition as we explore Jokassi, the jewel of the escarpment. Well, taking a look at this lake, especially on a perfect autumn day like today, and you might think it's just absolutely pristine, and it's not. <laughs> this is a man-made lake, and it's actually not that old. This lake was constructed between 1968 and 1971. By 1971, it was filling up water. And if you ever want to know what this area looked like prior to the lake filling it up, all you have to do is watch a very popular movie, a classic, Deliverance. The first few minutes of that program show you the dam, the wall, the quarry where they uh, took the rock material to make the dam, being constructed and, and much of the valley when it was just freshly timbered and getting ready um, to be flooded. So what was flooded when we built this lake? It was years and years and years of history. And Jocassi Valley behind me is where this lake gets its name. And that valley had been settled and farmed for generations, but maybe for a thousand years before that, Native Americans made their home here in these rich and fertile valleys where these many rivers came down and spread all the alluvium, all the rich soil into those valleys that they converged in. And it wasn't just the history that went underwater at that time. It was also a lot of natural history that went underwater because this was a wild and free flowing river. The hillsides in this valley were the location for many of the plants that make their home really only in this gorgeous area. Well, just the simple fact of building this lake and suddenly we can make our way fairly easily into the upper river gorges that would have been, I don't know, a day, a day and a half or more hike from the closest point to get into. These extremely remote areas are much easier to explore, much easier to experience today. And the fact that the lake ended up being mostly protected around the shoreline, the fact that there's only 37 home sites and that's it, the fact there's only one boat ramp, and so the boat traffic on this lake is really light. Except for on busy holiday weekends, really in the summer, you can come here and be, just like today, virtually the only boat in sight. And the bird life, the animal life, has also adapted to this lake being here. And there's a lot of things today that we find here in Oconee and Pickens County that we would have never seen here if he'd been here in the 17 or 1800s. The sheer beauty of this place is, well, it's overwhelming. And if that was the only selling point for the importance of this incredible lake and this incredible region, it would be enough, enough to make number nine out of 50. This is Wright's Creek Falls, and it's one of many waterfalls that empty directly into Lake Jocassi. And that creates almost like a fairy tale world where you have this incredibly beautiful lake, these incredible hills and waterfalls all joining together. And on many days, when it's not peak season in the summer, just like today, you can come out and be the only person in a place like this. The water here in Lake Jocassi 
is among the cleanest and clearest of any body of water, freshwater body of water in North America. You see, this lake is formed from four major tributaries. It's formed from the Whitewater, the Thompson, the Toxaway, and the Horse Pasture. And they all converged where Jocassee Valley itself used to set underneath this lake today. And those rivers are wild, wild places. They flow through essentially wilderness from just over the North Carolina line all the way down into Lake Jocassee. The clarity of the water is unbelievable. And that's because these watersheds are all on forested slopes. There's no development. There's not much at all to ruin the water quality, to send sediment down into the water. So the water, when it aggregates down here in the, in the lake, is just stunningly beautifully clear. And that makes it a real go-to for people that want to experience scuba diving in a freshwater lake where the clarity is almost what you see in the Caribbean. It makes it just a paradise for kayaking here on the lake. Um, there's hardly a kayaking site on any lake anywhere in the world I know that's better than this. And this falls right here, Wright's Creek Falls. When the lake is up, you can actually take a kayak right behind that waterfall. And when it's down, you can beat your kayak right here and walk up and walk behind that waterfall and get a view of a waterfall that most people never get a chance to see. The view from behind. But aside from just the water sports that are here, this lake provides an incredible habitat for many species that wouldn't have been here without the lake being built. So we have three species of trout here. We have the state record rainbow trout and the state record brown trout coming from this lake. But there's also bass, largemouth, spotted bass, smallmouth bass, and the native and endemic Bartram's bass is found in this lake. All of the typical suspects, and then some that are really special like the Bartram's bass that are unique to the upper parts of the drainages of these Atlantic drainage rivers that are sort of at the very top end of where they, where they begin right here with Lake Jocassi. It's an incredible place and the scenery, the beauty of this place, that's enough to make it one of the top 50. But it goes so much deeper than that because this place doesn't just hold beauty, it holds diversity. Well, it's almost impossible not to notice the incredible diversity that surrounds Lake Jocassi this time of year. Because right now in the autumn, all of the hues and colors that are just different for every species and every individual of the deciduous trees that coat the slopes of these hills are in full glory. And right behind me here on Double Springs Mountain, we can see not just one or two species, but a whole myriad of deciduous tree species. Last count that I had, about 121 species of trees that are found around Lake Jocassee. Out of those 121 trees, over 100 species are deciduous and each one has its own unique hue so that this time of year I can pick out the deep colors, those deep burgundies that are made by things like sourwood and the brilliant reds and yellows that red maples come in. They really shade out in two different colors and the incredible brilliant gold this time of year of the hickories. But the diversity is way bigger than just trees here. Pickens County and Oconee County that share this lake, they each hold close to 2,000 species of plants alone. Many of the plants and animals that are found here can be found nowhere else. They're what we call endemic species. You see, we're on the edge of the mountains. This is what we call an escarpment. And the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment ecoregion, which you're looking at right now, rising up behind my shoulders, this area is a place where you go from Piedmont directly uphill into the Blue Ridge, into the Appalachians. And in only about 23 miles as the crow flies from here, you can move from eight or 900 feet in elevation all the way up to over 6,000 feet at the peak of the Balsam Mountains. And climatologically, that's like driving from a place like Clemson, South Carolina, all the way up to the southern shores of Hudson Bay in Canada. You see, for every thousand feet we move up in elevation, we achieve the same amount of cooling as we would achieve if we drove about 500 miles north. Think about it. Over time, plants and animals have to be able to deal with change. And that change comes usually in the form of changing climate. Climate 
hasn't ever been static. It's always been changing. And as climate changes and as it goes to extremes, plants and animals have to be able to move to accommodate that. How much easier is it to move a few hundred feet or a few miles than it is to move two or 3,000 miles? So all escarpments work in that way by providing a vertical migration route for plants and animals to escape heat or to escape cold. This place is unique in having super high rainfall, super dependable water, and lots of it. Buffered temperatures because it's in the southern limit. And in over a very short period of time, it has very abruptly changing elevation. And all this has worked together to make this spot magical. But there's one more characteristic of this very area that has truly made it a crucible of life. And to see that, we're gonna travel right upstream a little bit farther into one of my favorite places on Earth, the Thompson River Gorge. All the water here in the gorges area leads to a luxuriant growth of vegetation too. And matter of fact, you find more species of mosses and liverworts here than any other place in Eastern North America. But it's not just the species richness here, it's what makes its home here in the gorges that's so unique. This fern, way back here, under the recess of the rock, this is single-story spleenwort. That is a tropical species of fern that's growing here in a cold, temperate climate. An incredible feature of these gorges is that they really are crucibles of life. They shelter life because all this moisture, the proximity to water, and the protectedness being down here in this deep, deep gorge of the Thompson River where I'm at right now means that it's sheltered from wind, from light, and from abrupt changes in weather. And the latent heat of evaporation of water, all the moisture in the air, helps to buffer the heat and the cold to keep it from extremes. And it allows things like the single-story spleenwort that otherwise <laughs> to find normally in the wild, you'd have to be in places like southern Mexico or South America. It allows these tropical ferns to grow here. The place has been able to shelter life because of these extreme gorges that provide tempered climate. Incredible. The crucible of life. Well, all of this rain up here in the Thompson River Gorge, coupled with all the moisture coming from the river itself that's just screaming down through here, means that we're literally in a rainforest. And like any rainforest, everything is covered with life. All the rocks and all the trees appear to be covered with moss, but not everything's a moss. This rock right behind me um, that looks like it's all moss is actually lichen, a lot of moss diversity, but the majority of what's covering this rock is liverwort. This one is an excellent example, and it's really common here in the Thompson River. This one is, I believe, a species of bazania, and they're really distinctive in that they fork at about a 45 degree angle or 60 degree angle when they do branch, and the tips of each one of those branches looks like a little hooded cobra to me with the little leaf-like structures coming out on either side and sort of declining. So you have to look really close to tell whether you're looking at a leucobrium or a, a dicranum, any of these mosses that are truly mosses, or whether actually what you're looking at is a liverwort. And believe it or not, we have one of the highest moss diversities anywhere in America here, and the highest diversity of liverworts in eastern North America, right here in the gorges. And when you start to look in close detail, you'll see there's probably five or six species of liverworts here and five or six species of moss just on one boulder. It's an incredible place and just what you'd expect in a temperate rainforest. It's in really protected places like this. This incredible little grotto that we've sort of walked back into here that the true nature of these gorges and the importance of these gorges really becomes clear as day if you know what you're looking at. We've seen that these incredibly humid places in these gorges hold high diversity, one of the highest diversities anywhere, of liverworts and mosses. But it also holds the highest diversity 
regionally, maybe in the United States, for ferns. And this, believe it or not, though it might look like a moss or a liverwort, this is a filmy fern. This is a fern that is from a tropical family. You don't expect to see them growing in a cold temperate climate like we're in here, but they're everywhere. And this one is the smallest of all four of the filmy ferns that make their home here. This one is known as Peter's filmy fern. And it, you'd hardly know it wasn't a liverwort because it is the smallest of all the species, but it's such a luxuriant growth of it right here way back in this recess. And it, this is where you find these ferns. You don't find them growing out where water, especially rainwater, is likely to wash them away. They grow in these deep, dark recesses where they're protected from rainwater and all the water they're getting is, is what seeps out of the rock and the humidity that's in the air. And that's really key for the survival of a filmy fern because a filmy fern has leaves that are really filmy. They're only a cell layer thick in most cases. And that means if they dry out at all, they're dead. So you have to live in a place next to rapidly flowing water in a protected gorge in a dark recess with enough rainfall to provide seepage water coming through the rocks as well. And those conditions really aren't common in the temperate world. This is a species that's really unique to the Appalachians. This one is not tropical. It comes from a family of tropical ferns and believe it or not, just a few drainages over in East Otoe Creek, we have a species of fern called Hymenophyllum tunbridgeensis. And Hymenophyllum tunbridgeensis is called the Tunbridge fern. It's known from a little corner of England Ireland, where it doesn't really freeze, and one spot in all of North America, and that's here in East Otoe Creek. Otherwise, this fern is found in the tropics, in cloud forests in the Caribbean, in Central America, in South America, and I also can find it here in the gorges. The filmy ferns are just an incredible example of how long this place has been constant enough, at least these microclimates that are created have been constant enough to provide a home um, that's stable enough for a tropical fern to land its spores here and long enough to become isolated enough to speciate into a unique and endemic species like the Peter's filmy fern. Well, the really crazy thing here is um, this is from a tropical family. There are tropical liverworts. There's other tropical ferns, the single story spleenwort. They're growing right here in this very drainage. But just on the other side of this rock, is mountain spleenwort. And that's a fern that we don't usually think of growing at low elevations. I think of that fern growing on the coldest, most exposed peaks, places like Grandfather Mountain. So we have really northern ferns, tropical ferns, growing side by side in these gorges. And that's the magic here. We're so deep incised in this landscape, we're protected. The water itself provides even more humidity than the already rainy area has and that humidity tends to buffer the climate. Well, down in the bottom of this gorge, the sun never shines, the wind very rarely blows, it's always a little warmer in the wintertime, and it's always much cooler in the summertime. These little tiny nooks and crannies in these gorges provide stable microclimates that have allowed plants and animals to find a home. And we already had one of the highest fern diversities anywhere in North America right here. But a new discovery that we just made pushes that number over the limit. Well, I'm here with my good friend, Brooks Wade, who is with Jocassi Lake Tours. And um, I've been lucky enough to spend a lot of time with Brooks out here on the lake and his wife, Kay. And um, Brooks has spent an enormous amount of time interested and in studying the loons on this lake. And when it comes to an unintended bonus, <laughs> sort of for what um, this lake has done, the loons have to be one of the highlights. No, it ab absolutely is, and, and because of their presence here, it is my favorite season of the year. They are the life of the lake in, in winter here. Yeah, they sure are, and, it, and it's just amazing to be out here, and you, you get to hear the loons yodel. We just heard them. We've been watching these groups um, feeding and resting and, and doing neat things. The ability to observe that I think is a rare thing 
for people who are who are more familiar with loons in the summer, they're just not that approachable in summer months. And nor right. do they form in these great groups that we get to see them here. 150, 160 birds every year. We've been counting them for several years now. So tell me what you've learned about these loons over the past couple of years. They ab actually forage feed and, and they will do what you see dolphins do in the ocean. They, they will herd fish and then, and then penetrate through the through the, uh, through the schools of fish. And no kidding. Never been witnessed in, in loons prior to observing them in a freshwater body of water. Wow. We have taken days where we spent six and eight hours and do nothing but data record on one bird. Really? For all day, all so day. Every five minutes, every two minutes, what's he doing? Is he diving? Is he peering, which is just looking into the water? Is he resting? They will actually nap at two o'clock. No kidding. If you watch the birds, it's just this universal nap time that goes on in the winter here around two o'clock. All wow. of a sudden the heads tuck, they rest, and they come out of that in 30 minutes, and then they proceed to get hungry again. And they, there's this behavioral pattern that goes on through the day between resting, peering, uh, adventuring a little bit. It's a predictable, recordable behavior that goes on uh, wow. in a day. They go to the same breeding ponds in, in summer every year, same one, and not only to the same lake, to the same region of a, of a lake. And it's such a weird bird with those feet all the way back so far back on its body that it can't even walk on land and to think that this bird has been living like this for millions of years you know and just in the last well four decades decided to make its home here so if you ever get a chance to come to Lake Jocassi you have to come out and visit the loons because it really is an experience that a lot of southerners don't get and you definitely don't get as close to loons as we are lucky enough to here on Lake Jocassi there's no better place to see loons. But this is only one of the unintended consequences of building this lake. And um, one of the most surprising consequences of building this lake, um, your wife found Kay. Indeed, and that's, indeed. And that's where we're headed next. I am constantly amazed at the diversity that we're still discovering. <laughs> the 21st century here in the Jocassi Gorges area. And two weeks ago, um, my friend Kay Wade had been telling me about a cliff break that she found on this exposed rock cut uh, just above the dam at Lake Jocassi. And she told me, well, it, we think it's a purple cliff break. And she really wanted to show me. Well, finally, she got me out here to show me. And I was absolutely beside myself because not only is it a cliff break, but it's not purple cliff break. It's not the one species that you would expect to find in South Carolina. It's a species that I know from West Texas. This is Wright's cliff break, Pelea Wrightiana. And there's not just this one small patch of Wright's cliff break. There's over 2,000 large clumps along about a quarter mile of shoreline here, all on this rock cut. But then when we came back last week, we saw with binoculars a couple other species that we couldn't get to. Today, we're going to bring a climber out and we're going to actually see if we can document, if we can have in hand a frond from two more species that are western in distribution. Well, the last time I was here it was extremely frustrating because I can see right up there and I can see through my binoculars what that fern is, but we don't actually have it documented until we have it in hand. We need a leaf to put in the herbarium, to put in a collection to document this plant from South Carolina. We're documented in every way. Photographs, video, and now with um, a dried leaf so that we can once and for all say that what we think is Astrolepis sinueta, a fern from like West Texas, is here in the Jocassi Gorges region. So I enlisted the help of my good friend, Cody Davis. He's worked at the garden, at the botanical garden with me for four years, getting ready to graduate and a really skilled rock climber for him. Nothing to get up there. And in a few minutes, we're gonna know whether or not we found another new fern for South Carolina and, and only the second time that this plant would be found east of Texas. What do you think, Cody? Gold on the bat? That's it. Awesome. Wow, dude. That is Astrolepis sinuata. And it, good gosh. Look how rich chestnut 
that is on the back. Um, and then the, uh, you see how the, each one of the pinnae are really symmetrical. Um, that's how you know it's not the other species that has been found. Only one other time, only one other species has been found, and then again, only once in the eastern U.S., and that's Astrolepis integeruma, which was found in uh, Alabama. But this is Astrolepis sinuata. And now that we have a specimen, sucker is documented for South Carolina, documented for the Carolinas, and the population here is huge. <laughs> like, there's thousands of these up on the cliff. We counted over 1,600 Palaea ridiana, and there's got to be over 500 plus clumps of this on this rock face. And all this rock face is just brand new exposed since 1968-69. I think we may have pushed Pickens County into having the highest diversity of fern and fern relatives of any county anywhere in the United States. We'll have to get home and tally up the numbers. But um, it's really exciting. And to be on the edge of discovery, is just remarkable. Cool. Perhaps the most beautiful thing about Jocassi to me is that despite our destruction, our change that we brought onto this system, life has found a way. Diversity continues to thrive, and the choices that we made have provided an avenue and an opportunity for new plants and new animals to make their home here, nestled in the hills. I'm Patrick McMillan. Wishing you your own exciting expedition. Gardening is one of the most ancient of human endeavors. But why do we garden? For many of us, it's a way to express ourselves artistically and otherwise. We go out into the world and find those things we love the most. We bring them home to create our own oasis of peace and solace. The way we garden, though, is changing rapidly as the world changes around us. I mean, 20 years ago, we wouldn't have been able to grow palmetto trees here in Clemson, South Carolina. And today, we have a thriving population of palmettos all over the garden. Diversity is collapsing around us. In particular, our insect populations, pollinators. Their populations are plummeting. Our choices, even our individual choices, have profound impacts on the world around us. And there's no more poignant place to see that than right here in your garden. Join me on today's expedition and decide for yourself how you can transform your garden into a garden for life. Well, this is pretty much your typical American landscape. Now, albeit we're right by a busy intersection, which if you think about most suburban and urban landscapes, this fits the mold. A couple, three dwarf yopons, some dwarf palmettos. Back here, some little southern bayberries. What's missing here is life. It's not filling the voids between these neatly ordered piles. Life doesn't do this naturally. This is a remnant of our history. What we've done here in America is we've adopted the concept of British colonialism right into our landscapes. The big difference between the way we have traditionally landscaped in America and the way that I landscape and the way that most modern gardeners are trying to push landscaping is that I, I look at the world through wild American eyes. Think about the places that you love, the natural places. What makes them beautiful? Think of how they look, how they function, how they feel, how they sound. You can duplicate that right here, even in a suburban and urban lot. If we abandon and throw off the shackles of colonialism, we just have to start using wild American eyes when we start to design these landscapes. So we have a choice to make. We have the choice of whether 
to fill space with life or to fill it with mulch and weeds. Here at the South Carolina Botanical Garden, we choose to minimize the amount of mulch we use. And that's because you have to replace mulch. And not only that, but you also have to weed mulched beds. And you have to make the decision of whether or not you're gonna spend your time weeding and remulching, or whether you're gonna fill that space with life and let life do the work for you. We do that by selecting species like this. This is strawberry begonia, and it's not a begonia at all. It's actually a species of saxifrage. And what I love about it is that this is evergreen. This is the cold time of year right now, and it still fills this bed with leaves and really helps to keep down the weeds. The great part about filling your garden with ground covers in between the plants rather than filling it with mulch is that these plants also support life. Some others that we use here at the South Carolina Botanical Garden include globe amaranth. Now that's a plant you can grow pretty much anywhere in this country. You can fill vacant spaces in full sunlight with this in virtually any texture soil. And globe amaranth comes with the added bonus of being one of the best plants I know of as a nectar source for butterflies, particularly skippers love globe amaranth. Another species that we use a lot here in the South Carolina Botanical Garden, particularly where we have loose or sandy soils, is a plant called blanket flower or gallardia. And that plant is not just a great ground cover, but it also provides one of the best seed sources I know of for seed eating birds. If you want to attract goldfinches into your garden, there's no better plant than blanket flower. Now, the choice is ours. We can either have a garden with a lot of mulch and a lot of weeding, or we can choose to fill that space with life and watch other life become attracted to that life and make your garden a richer place by far. When I became the director of the South Carolina Botanical Garden, I knew that we had to do something to transform the landscape, something to attract attention and set ourselves apart. I decided to use the resources we had, which was space, lots of space, 295 acres, and apply my philosophy of encouraging life in all forms throughout the garden. We here at the South Carolina Botanical Garden have changed our management regime to encourage life. We choose to let life fill every vacant space, and in much of the garden, we try to represent what South Carolina is and what it was by applying traditional land use techniques. Our management has produced one of the densest and most diverse pollinator populations I'm aware of. You can feel, hear, smell, and see the life all around you. And the South Carolina Botanical Garden has become one of the best nature reserves I know of in our state. The crowning achievement and central exhibit here applies all of our holistic concepts to represent South Carolina from the mountains to the sea. This grand experiment has set us apart, the Natural Heritage Garden. The unique thing about the Natural Heritage Garden is really that we didn't make a garden. We made habitats that are found in South Carolina. So here in this garden, we find all of those things that you encounter when you actually visit the natural communities out and about in South Carolina and the southeastern United States. So this is a great example. When you enter the Cove Forest here, in the Natural Heritage Garden, it's as though you've been transported up into a cool, moist cove in places like the Jocassi Gorges or up near the fish hatchery above Wahala. In this exhibit, you're not looking at a group of plants that grow in the cove forest. You're looking at an actual cove forest ecosystem that's been brought into the garden. The rock that occurs in this type of forest is here. The soil that's derived from that rock, be it acidic or basic or in between, is here. The hydrology is here. The moisture is here, and the vegetation and ecosystem processes that happen in these communities are here, exactly like you'd see in the wild. You're literally transported out into South Carolina, and that, that's what makes this incredible trail what it is, and I can't wait to share the rest of it with you. One of the first extensive habitats that you walk into along the Natural Heritage Garden Trail is the Acidic Cove Forest. This is a very typical type of habitat that we find throughout, and commonly throughout, the escarpment region, the mountains of South Carolina. And you can always tell the soil pH in a mountain cove forest 
by the type of plants that you notice in this habitat. You see, acid soils come from acid rocks, things like granites and country rock. You can see these rocks displayed right here in this exhibit. We've gone to great lengths to bring the rock type, the soil type, and duplicate what you actually find in nature when you're here along the Natural Heritage Garden Trail. And so looking around this habitat, all you need to do is look at the vegetation to determine if your soil is acidic or basic or neutral. And if you find lots of evergreens, species like the gorge rhododendron, the mountain laurels, or species that are in that family, the heath family, like deciduous azaleas, flame azaleas, pinkster flowers, blueberries, dog hobble. All of those plants, those evergreen heaths, and even the deciduous heaths, are very well adapted to growing in acidic soils. Now, acid soils have very limited nutrient availability. That's because most elements are not really very mobile, very accessible by plants at low pH. And if you have a hard time getting at those nutrients and incorporating them, especially calcium into your leaves, then you probably don't want to throw away those leaves at the end of the year. That's why evergreen species are encouraged to grow in these acidic forests. An incredibly cool habitat full of lots of really cool plants, but it's not the incredible show of wildflowers that we find in the habitat that's just ahead. The next section you come to looks very different than the acidic cove forest. All of a sudden, there's no evergreens in this exhibit. And you're met with, in the springtime, a solid, massive carpet of wildflowers. This is probably my favorite section of the trail in the spring, simply because there are just so many hundreds of species of plants that green up and color up the area. This is very different from the acidic cove forest because of the bedrock that occurs here. This is a basic cove forest, or a rich cove forest. And that basic or rich refers to the rock type which builds the soil type. The rock found here in South Carolina that leads to the higher pH of this habitat is a rock called amphibolite. It's this dark black rock that's situated throughout the exhibit here. And that dark black rock is high in magnesium and in some cases high in calcium. And that bumps up the pH and allows nutrients to be much more available for plants. And so if nutrients are abundant, you don't have to worry about holding on to your leaves over the winter like evergreens do. And you can toss away those nutrients at the end of the growing season and not worry about where you're gonna replenish them from the next year. So the carpet of wildflowers you see before you is pretty typical of the Rich Cove Forest. To many people, trillium are the most beautiful of spring wildflowers. And there's no place better to see trillium than right here in the Rich Cove Forest section of the Natural Heritage Garden Trail. Trillium, are named trillium because they have parts in threes. They have three petals, three sepals, three leaves, and six stamens, three times two, and three parted or six parted ovaries. So everything in parts of three, try trillium. <laughs> Beautiful plants, and there are two main groups, those that have their flowers held directly up against the leaves, like this lance leaf trillium, or the pale or faded trillium that's so characteristic of the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment region here that we're representing in this exhibit. And then there are those that have their flowers held on pedicels above the leaves, those like the sweet white trillium, the bent trillium, and the wake robins, the great white trillium. Even though they look so different, those pedicels, different colored flowers, they're actually very closely related to members of the same genus, the genus trillium. That genus turns out to have a really cool story too. Trillium are more abundant here in the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment ecoregion, our backyard, our mountains of South Carolina, than anywhere else on the planet. There's more species per unit area. Now why? Well, it's not just trillium. There's more trillium per square inch, there's more wild gingers per square inch, and there's also more salamanders per square inch. So why more species here in the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment? It has to do with the fact that trillium, salamanders, and wild gingers are all very poor at migration. You see, trillium and wild gingers are carried around. Their seeds are carried around by ants. And ants can't carry seeds too far. And it takes about seven to 10 years to grow an adult trillium. So in seven to 10 years, they might be able to disperse maybe 100 meters, 100 yards approximately. And that's just simply not fast enough to keep up with climate change. They can't escape changing climates to migrate north or south. Well, this little section of our mountains has provided a place where these species can exist in the same region without having to move long distances to accommodate 
for changes in climate. How do they do that? Well, they can migrate up and down slopes because there's a lot of elevation change in a very short distance here. And we are at the very southern edge of the Blue Ridge, so we catch more moisture than anywhere else in the mountains, and maybe we have a slightly more tempered climate than anywhere else in the mountains. But also, our mountains are dissected by deep gorges, and those gorges themselves shelter humid, moist microclimates that are always warmer in the wintertime and always cooler in the summertime than the surrounding area. And all those things have worked together over eons to produce this incredible assortment of plants, places that I call crucibles of life during times of change. The trail continues into the Piedmont habitats. Today, we think of the natural state of this region as mostly forests, but in the not so distant past, much of it was savanna and prairie. The reason was traditional land management, management with fire. Native Americans used this tool extensively to provide the grass and forbs that their primary game animals needed. We know this from colonial era naturalists like Mark Catesby, who visited the area as early as 1723. For thousands of years, this fire persisted, and today we have reintroduced this historic management regime into the South Carolina Botanical Garden. We burn our nine-acre Piedmont Prairie every year, typically in late winter or early spring. The recovery is dramatic and rapid, and it's not just recovery, it's an essential part of the lives of the plants and animals that historically called this habitat home. It doesn't take long to recover from fire. I mean, it recovers at breakneck speed here in this ecosystem. And right now, here, only six, eight weeks after a fire, and you can hardly tell the place burned at all. And it has not just burned and recovered, it's a resurgence of life. It's an incredible burst of flower and green that has just coated this prairie. So here in late spring, we've already got some of what we call the endemics, the plants that are found in this habitat and nowhere else on planet Earth blooming. The one right in front of me here, this very strange spidery flower is smooth cone flower. And it's one of a number of species that is only found in open, formerly fire maintained habitats here in the Piedmont and in the mountains of the Carolinas. This plant once occupied this habitat when this habitat was all across the Piedmont of the Carolinas. So only a few weeks after fire, and you can see not only are things blooming, we've got white wild indigo in addition to the cone flower, also butterfly weed flowering right here behind me, beautiful clumps of butterfly weed. And the Georgia aster is already almost uh, waist high. I mean, it's just incredible to see in only eight weeks the kind of recovery we have and everything didn't just come back, it came back more vibrant and thicker than it was before. But this is only the beginning of this growing season. And as the growing season progresses, we get a better idea of just what Mark Catesby might have walked through in 1723. Life needs water. Providing water in your garden is a sure way to bring life to you. Ponds are popular features in gardens, but most are sterile. Our ponds, even the very formal ones, are full of water plants and free from pesticide, and the result is a thriving community of aquatic animals. Dragonflies, damselflies, and other predatory insects are super abundant here. Though we have so much still water in the garden, we don't have a mosquito problem. That's because the predators are doing the control for us. A clean, neat, fish-filled wetland is a fairly sterile wetland. Here, we have the opposite. And this is illustrated by our leaky pond. This allows us to introduce our visitors to a model Carolina Bay. Though it's spring in the cove, the bay has yet to green up. Carolina bays were discovered not long after man achieved flight. After the airplane was invented and pilots were flying along the Carolina coast, they noticed that there were thousands and thousands of very similar egg-shaped depressions pockmarking our coastal plain, all oriented in the same direction, northwest to southeast. Nobody's really sure how Carolina bays were formed, but <laughs> it doesn't mean there's any shortage of hypotheses. They range from meteor showers, in other words, objects from outer space bombarding our coastal plain and creating all these patterned wetlands, 
two much more accepted theories, like the gradual theory of formation that involves the groundwater and the underlying bedrock sinking and coastal currents combined with even the wind blowing from a predominantly southwesterly direction during the ice ages. All these things coming together to form these incredible Carolina bays that we see today. They vary in size from less than an acre to hundreds and hundreds of acres. Lake Waccamaw, one of the largest natural lakes in the Carolinas, is in fact a Carolina Bay. Regardless of where they came from, these Carolina Bays shelter wildlife ranging in size from black bears down to the tiniest of insects. Thousands of species make their home here, and even with plants, you find more species, rare species associated with these Carolina Bays than any other habitat type in South Carolina. One thing's for certain, Carolina Bays today are threatened. They're at risk. They're at risk because they no longer are protected as wetlands under the Clean Water Act. A Supreme Court decision back in 2002 removed isolated wetlands from receiving the same protection as those that are connected to navigable bodies of water. What this has meant is lots of Carolina bays are being converted. They're being drained, converted to farmland. They're also threatened by urbanization as our neighborhoods spread out into the wildlands that once were just home to wildlife in South Carolina. And it spells disaster for all those species that depend on isolated wetlands. Carolina bays today are in need of our help and our support and even restoration. It's just amazing to me to think that something that happened so long ago in the geologic past could be so important to the life that we see in South Carolina today. From here, the trail continues into the habitats of the Carolina Coastal Plain. It's hard to believe that we were able to recreate a functioning coastal plain community here in the upstate of South Carolina. But when provided with all the elements they need for growth, that's exactly what we've done. The Longley Pine Sandhills, Savannas, and even the maritime communities are all represented here. The wetland savannas illustrate a habitat that represents the most diverse natural community on small spatial scales anywhere in the temperate world. 60 to 100 different plants alone can coexist in a single square meter. This is where most of the carnivorous plants thrive, and the Natural Heritage Garden provides an immersive experience to view how fire, water, soil, and humans all interact to produce our natural communities. Perhaps the most surprising habitat found here is the maritime forest. This area, complete with palmettos and Spanish moss, would not have survived here in this part of South Carolina only two decades ago. The entire collection of plants have changed as weather has changed. Any botanical garden director will tell you that whether you believe it or not, climate change is happening. Our climate is changing and one of the goals of our garden is to experiment with new plant material to allow us to continue to have a thriving garden that supports life even in the face of water shortages and a changing climate. You don't have to go to California to see a super bloom. You can see a super bloom right here in South Carolina at the South Carolina Botanical Garden. And this is the same sort of bloom that you would have seen if you'd been in California earlier this spring, because these are the same desert annuals that are responding to the cooler, moister times during the winter and early spring here, the same way they do in California. And this garden here in South Carolina is dedicated to trying to understand how we can cope with climate change in our own home landscapes. This is an unbelievably beautiful and incredibly colorful example of what I think makes the South Carolina Botanical Garden so, so special. You see, we employ a method of gardening called habitat gardening. So instead of just bringing you desert plants to show you in the garden, we bring the desert alive for you to experience. When you walk the trails through this desert, you are experiencing the Chihuahuan Desert ecoregion, the thorn scrub, the mesquite trees, the oaks, the scrubby plants that you wouldn't think of bringing into a garden are here. The grasses, even things that you might think look like weeds, they're all part of the ecosystem that we've brought into the garden. And when you employ something holistically like this, you'll see a response from the wildlife. So these plants, which aren't, of course, native to South Carolina, in most cases, these are plants that are native only west of the Mississippi, but these plants are what we call near natives. They're still North American plants. And if you take a look around, you'll see species of oaks supporting caterpillars that our native oaks support, and you'll see incredible numbers of pollinators visiting these plants. And your experience walking through this garden is a richer one because you actually get to visit and feel the heat 
the sights, the sounds of a true Chihuahuan desert experience. Well, it's more than that. This collection is really unparalleled. We have over 640 species here, and that gives us the opportunity to have a living laboratory that we can use to try and figure out how best to cope with changing climate in our home landscapes. Cacti are so much more than just spines. Even though this garden isn't just dedicated towards producing succulents and cacti like this one, I don't want you to forget that cacti have some of the most beautiful flowers of any of the flowering plants on the planet. The diversity, the colors, and the numbers of flowers are outstanding. And these are fantastic pollinator support plants. You've never seen so many bees in your life. It says the bees that are drawn to these incredibly huge flowers on cacti. So don't forget, even though cacti are a little cliche to have in a drought tolerant garden, a drought tolerant garden wouldn't have nearly the color without the beauty of cacti. This is a perfect example of a true winner. This is what this garden is about. This is a Texas sundrop, Callilophus berlanderi, subspecies pinifolius. And that species is exactly the type of plant we're looking for for a resilient landscape in the south. It has flowers that are produced in abundance from April all the way to frost. You see in the desert, or in the Edwards Plateau region where this plant comes from, it will flower in response to rains, but here, where it doesn't get really, really droughty for long periods, it just continues to flower and flower and flower. So what you're looking at here is what you'll see in your landscape for the entirety of the growing season. And because of the region this comes from, West Texas, this plant is adapted to both humid summers and cold winters. This is the kind of thing that can transform landscapes in the Southeast. But this is only one of a whole host of species that we have found that have the potential to really transform the industry in the Southeast. I hope that wherever you live, wherever you garden, that you create an oasis of life full of positive choices. There's no better place to see just how important our choices are than right here in your garden. I'm Patrick McMillan, wishing you your own exciting